Taraji to Ahimsa Conversations. So, what is your earliest memory of the My idea God. or the practice? Growing up in a Jain family, you know, Ahimsa was an idea that was very familiar within in the background, so to say. You know, as a child, of course, I did not have um, a proper understanding of the idea, but I saw certain things. One of the things that sort of really had a deep impression on me as a child was the idea of forgiveness, which the Jains, you know, embrace uh, uh, both uh, as a protocol and I hope as in spirit as well. But there is this sense that you need to seek forgiveness and you need to forgive and sort of clear your account. The idea being that if you in fact did something wrong, said something, you know, that you shouldn't have said to someone uh, intentionally or unintentionally, you made somebody feel bad that you not only seek forgiveness, um, but you also learn a lesson of not repeating the same thing again. Although, in the following, you know, the next year, subsequent year, you would be seeking forgiveness for something else and you will be forgiven. But I think this was something that really uh, touched me in that sense as a child. Um, but otherwise, in many other ways, the idea of sanyam, um, you know, um, using the, the Hindi word now, sanyam or self discipline, um, was very central to the practice and my mom, my grandfather particularly, uh, practiced so many different things that as a child, I didn't understand why they were doing it, but they would take a vow every day, uh, how many items they will eat, or you know how many times they will bathe during the day, or how far they will travel. So it was kind of a limitation of the kind of violence that was not necessary to uh, sort of uh, incur and to be away from that kind of violence. So, um, Can you say a bit more here about the nature of this self-restraint yeah. and how you understood this self-restraint to be a form of ahimsa? Can you say a bit more about that, please? Yes, I can say that now. I don't think I can claim that I understood when I was, I was a child about it, but I know that I can understand now. So, for example, uh, uh, limiting yourself to eating, you know, a certain number of things and saying you won't eat more than 12 items, 10 items, 20 items, whatever that, that vow may be for you, is that you are taking a vow not to encroach upon, you know, uh, things in the nature, as, you know, because the Jains consider that even uh, the vegetation has life. Uh, and so the less you sort of take to um, fulfill your needs, the better it is for you. Uh, so I think in that sense, it is ahimsa, because you are limiting your himsa. Um, uh, and, but this is something I understand now much better, or it had environmental repercussions, you know, that how you respect the ecology and how you respect other living beings, uh, or the consumption of water, for example, which today we are talking about because of environmental things and because it is such a precious commodity. But for the Jains, water too is a living source. And so the less you consume is better. And I also understand it now that if you uh, waste water, it is violence because you're preventing somebody else who might otherwise use this precious resource. So those are some of the issues. But I don't think I understood all of these kind of things when I was growing up as a child. But when I reflect back on, on these things, they appear that, uh, uh, you know, how the people who were taking these vows, whether it was my grandfather or my mom or my dad, uh, that they were trying to limit their himsa. And in that sense, it was a himsa. When I did my master's in India, it was in modern, modern India was my, was my focus. And so Gandhi was central to modern India.
um, but I hadn't, I wasn't studying at that time Gandhi from the perspective of nonviolence and non, how nonviolence creates change. That thing began to happen to me once I began teaching. And when I began teaching, I realized that college textbooks, you know, whether it was world history or was, was it uh, any other history, that almost always explained change through bloodshed, you know, bloody revolutions, violence. And even though there was such a rich historiography of nonviolent social change, that it did not sort of filter through the textbooks, the college textbooks. So the undergraduates that I was teaching after finishing my uh, PhD um, had such a sort of a monolithic view of how change is created. They absolutely had no idea of how change could be created by nonviolence means. So this, so in one sense, this whole idea of studying about nonviolence and nonviolent change came to me as a student of history and through my own students that I was teaching. So teaching world history, seeing the textbooks of world history and not finding, you know, the role of nonviolence in creating social and political change was very disturbing to me. And it was very um, sort of also uh, a bit of disappointment to see that because of the kind of education students were receiving in high school and then coming to college from that background and then reading these kind of textbooks, that they uh, did, did also had a very skewed sense of what is power. So power to them meant coercion, control, uh, you know, if you're holding a gun, then you are powerful. You know, if you're a military state or if you have a strong military or armed forces, then you are strong. So their sense of what is power, what is strength was also very monolithic in nature. And so that really inspired me uh, at the dawn of this century that I needed to do something with my life, something more meaningful than just teaching history year after year after and just being critical of the textbooks. I know the civil rights movement is very much documented and covered, but that yes. nonviolence as a method entered yeah. the American stage through mm -hmm. uh, Martin Luther King and his colleagues. Was this so completely overlooked, you think, in the history department? It is, it is overlooked. Um, the nonviolence part of it is overlooked. If I asked my students, what did they hear about? Everybody knows the name of Martin Luther King. Everybody has heard about civil rights movement. But when you begin to talk to them about nonviolence, when you begin to ask them, did you ever read King's Pilgrimage to Nonviolence, the essay? No. They have no idea what was this pilgrimage. They have no idea how King came to nonviolence. There is an essay that uh, King writes, which he calls, my pilgrimage to nonviolence. And in that, King is talking about, you know, that he was looking for solutions of racism, solutions of poverty, solutions of injustice and oppression that the African Americans were facing in this country. And it, it is a very important essay in my uh, opinion because not only it, is, it tells us about how King got to nonviolence, but it also tells us about how King sought to learn from the intellectuals you know, of the modern world. So there he's talking about a variety of intellectuals that he came across, including Nietzsche, Marx, and that he was trying to find solutions from all of these people. Then he is talking about that he heard in a lecture um, about Gandhi. And after he heard about the lecture, he got so inspired. And this story that how he gets inspired by listening about Gandhi from someone who had just visited India, okay, and had met Gandhi. And he got so inspired that he went uh, to a bookstore, bought half a dozen books on Gandhi and read them all. 
And then he writes about it, that he found what he was looking for in Gandhi, because it allowed him to see that how Gandhi's uh, sort of uh, active nonviolence was very consistent with what he thought was the notion of love in the Christian ethic. And, and so he comes to this conclusion that that's where his pilgrimage to nonviolence ends with Gandhi. So that's, that's the most important thing, which none of these people would know because they don't read that. They will read about civil rights movement. They might read about his letter from Birmingham jail. They might read about his Nobel speech that he gave. But they don't go to this pilgrimage to nonviolence because nonviolence has, not, has been as if it is, it is something that you have allergy with. Everybody talks about civil rights movement without nonviolence. And there is no mention, and it's not just civil rights movement as many, many leaders. Of course, most people only focus on King. But the person who really brought nonviolence into the movement was James Lawson, who is still alive, who is in his 90s now. And James Lawson, you know, was trained in Gandhian uh, philosophy and Gandhian tactics. And he led the lunch counter sit-ins in Nashville. Tennessee. And that whole movement was student movement, something that there's a documentary about. I'm sure you have seen that. And I show that to my students in the hope to inspire them that, look, this movement was led by the students like yourselves, you know, in the 1960s. And that led to desegregation, you know, in the United States. And that's an important thing. So there are things or, you know, uh, the march, the Selma march and things like that. Um, which are often sort of uh, uh, dismissed as uh, direct action, but not talked about that what was central to this direct action uh, and how was it different from the violent mode of action that people like Malcolm X, for example, were, were seeking. They too were fighting for civil rights, but they had a different way of seeking it than, let's say, some of the nonviolent uh, movements. In light of this, uh, would you say that the nonviolence uh, part of the Martin Luther King legacy was mm -hmm. almost actively rejected by the Black Rights Movement? And, uh, or does nonviolence have even a small space in the Black Lives Matter campaign? Um, I think yes and no. So. In fact, um, it's, it, is, it is hard. So your, your question, I guess, you were asking in the context of what is happening currently in the United States? Yes. Am I right? Yes, yes. Okay. So even though you keep hearing Black Lives Matter and Black Lives uh, Movement definitely is one of the important participants in this whole uh, protest movement that is still going on in the United States. What I want to emphasize that this movement is not simply limited to the Black Lives uh, uh, folks. Um, there are people from all walks of life. If you look at the protesting people, you will see there are Caucasians, there are Asians, there are Middle Eastern, there are Hispanic. And there are, of course, the African-Americans. So it's a very, very diverse movement, which is very different about it, so even though they're all saying Black Lives Matter. And which just shows that finally, everybody seems to have understood that the African-American, there has been a deep sense of injustice against the African-Americans, even though, you know, we are now, uh, several decades after the civil rights, you know, movement and the legislations that ensued from there, right? Uh, that we, we have come far away, but still racism persists in the United States. And it is within the system, it is entrenched within uh, whether it is the policing or other institutions where it is deeply entrenched. That definitely has, has been... And another thing that is important to acknowledge is that even though there was violence initially in some places, there was looting, 
the movement by far, I would say, has remained nonviolent and peaceful, which is wonderful. And that is the reason why the movement is sort of eliciting support from abroad, from European cities, from UK. Um, and there is a there is a kind of um, uh, uh, scenes that you really don't see in these protests otherwise. So for example, you will see politicians now and then joining the protesters. Um, uh, people from the police are joining in some cities. They are coming and joining, shaking hands with the protesters, um, which really tells us that finally, you know, this is beginning to uh, resonate with a larger number of audience and hopefully it will lead to some sort of legislation or some sort of positive change so that is there now as far as the black lives matter i really don't know that much about it uh, about the movement to really comment on them that they um uh, totally dis reject um the king um legacy i'm not really an expert on that so i'm not going to comment because i might not be you know i don't have uh, proper knowledge to really make that assessment so i'll refrain from that but as far as the current movement is going i think we are finding that it is largely very peaceful people are you know um um protesting uh, insisting on being there um uh, sort of engaging in civil disobedience um violating the curfew although now the curfew is no longer there but even when the curfew was there they were willing to go to jail if they were imprisoned but that they were going to uh, you know engage in civil disobedience but peacefully and which is very very inspiring i think and it is resonating with the lawmakers there is an there is an effort uh, going on in the in the Congress to see if they can legislate something that might uh, sort of uh, have some sort of uh, uh, restraint on the police brutality and provide some ideas for training the police so that they don't engage in this kind of uh, uh, treatment, which is meted out to Floyd. Tara, does this also validate uh, an observation that a lot of research uh, has uh, confirmed that uh, a non-violent struggle, or, mm -hmm. uh, whether it involves civil disobedience or just expression of protest and angst, that mm -hmm. a non-violent struggle is able to draw a much larger and wider number of people? Mm -hmm. uh, do, it does. It validates that. Yes, it does validate that. And that is the reason why from all walks of life, why the Caucasians are coming. Because, you know, otherwise, when uh, in the first two days, uh, when some looting and vandalism happened you, because of certain elements that were, you know, that, that, that tried to uh, take this opportunity for their self-interest, you know, it created, it tainted the movement initially. But then after that, the movement really became very peaceful. And you see the, you know, um, uh, the people from different segments of society joining the protest movement. And yes, it does validate that nonviolence attracts, you know, more support. Uh, Tara, to your knowledge, to the best of your knowledge, a, in the last 30 years, has the kind of training in nonviolence which the American civil liberties, uh, civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s excelled in, uh, very mm -hmm. intense and very rigorous trainings in nonviolence mm -hmm. were done at that time in the 50s and 60s. Uh, mm -hmm. In the last 30, 40 years, do you know if that kind of work has persisted in any parts of the US? Yes, uh, although, you know, in a very limited way, but I, I'm personally aware of uh, uh, a few instances. For example, James Lawson, whose name I mentioned, he continues to give his seminars on nonviolence. 
the thing that he began in Nashville, you know, with those students during the civil rights movement, he continues to have his Saturday seminars. I think he still does them twice a month. I don't know with COVID and all, obviously there is a interruption in that thing, but he was doing that up until 2019. I know that. Then there is Bernard Lafayette, who also comes from that, uh, uh, that movement. And he does training around the world in nonviolence. Okay. And he's also worked with um, Jean Sharp, you know, who um, has done so much work on uh, strategic nonviolence around the world, you know, uh, trying to show uh, dictatorial regimes how they could sort of uh, um, go towards democracy. Uh, using those nonviolent methods. I think he has this 198 methods of nonviolent tactics and so on and so forth. So um, there, there has been those kind of uh, things. There's also an organization uh, called Waging Nonviolence. And that organization also trains uh, people. Again, those, these are all, uh, except for James Lawson, who actually talks about the principle of nonviolence and what does it mean, the philosophy of it, and why we should do that. I think um, whether it is Beijing Nonviolence Group or the Jean Sharp Group, or to some extent even Bernard Lafayette's group, they focus more on tactics, on strategic nonviolence. Uh, tell us about how and why you decided to open an Ahimsa Center at uh, California Polytechnic. Uh, so connecting to the idea that why I was interested in nonviolence and nonviolent social change to bring it back to my own discipline of history, um, where it should have an important role and must be included in teaching college students. Um, in addition to that, at the dawn of this century, certain things were happening that sort of brought about this idea in my mind that I needed to do something uh, more meaningful with my life than simply teaching. And so in towards the close of, I believe, 1999, Columbine happened. Columbine school shooting happened. And uh, then uh, later uh, that, you know, we had this Iraq war. Um, which had created a lot of debate within, within the United States, um, whether we should have gone to that war, just like the Vietnam War, which had incited a whole lot of debate in this country in the 1960s. I think Iraq War was something like that. And I began to think about that this is where this kind of violence, whether it is the violence of war, and a war that was not justified, or the violence in schools particularly bothered me a lot. Uh, that is not to say that there had not been violence in schools before that, but I think Columbine was the first school shooting that had an impact on me because it was for probably for the first time that nearly, uh, I believe 15 to 20 people were dead. 15 to 20 students were dead and similar number was injured. Now I could be wrong on the figures a little bit, but that's what I recall that. And that, that's a huge number for a school to lose to, to shooting like that. And I began to think that what can I do within, within my sort of area where I operate, that is the university, and I thought that we should create a center which would become a forum for doing certain kinds of things. And so I began to talk to people on campus. Uh, my idea was to bring about generational change and generational change by exposing our youngsters within the mainstream, not the community, you know, who are already, you know, aware of nonviolence. Uh, it will be preaching to the choir. So there was no point in doing that, but I wanted to do something in the mainstream 
where the idea can catch on and where students can begin at least to reflect, even if they don't have a buy into it, they at least are exposed to the idea. Because my idea was not to convert anyone. That wouldn't be nonviolence. The idea was to expose them, to make them rethink, to make them learn that there were other ways in which people had thought of creating change, that violence is not the only answer to all these problems, and to bring about that exposure for uh, the college students. So that, that was my idea. It took about a year, and I had kind of given up on it because it was taking so long. Uh, but one fine day in uh, November of 2003, my dean called and said, your proposal is approved. And I said, yes. Oh my God, now I'll have to do all of that work that I said <laughs> I, was going to, I was going to do. You went on through the center to work with school teachers on nonviolence. Can you tell us uh, in a bit of detail what those workshops were like? And what you were aiming to do there and what, what you learned about the, both the creative challenge and the uh, possibilities of uh, nonviolence in everyday life, especially with young people in America. Yes. So uh, before I answer that question, let me sort of give a background that where did this fit into and why is it that I started this program for the school teachers, right? So the AMSA Center, as I envisioned it, had three different areas of focus. One was to create uh, programs for our own students, undergraduates on campus. And for them, I created a collaborative program in which nearly 10 departments on campus participate, a minor in nonviolent studies so that we have that degree program on our campus. That was one part, so that students are exposed. So there are courses from history, from English, from political science, from um, philosophy, from uh, kinesiology, a course on yoga and uh, stress management. Then the idea was that how do we, in the long term, get this kind of thinking, this concept of nonviolence, what it is and what it is not, uh, to the schools, uh, how children can learn about it, and so that when they graduate from schools and they come to college, they will have a better understanding about it, right? It was in that context that I designed the teacher's program because when we had some discussion it was suggested to me that why don't we create we meaning we on campus create curriculum on nonviolence and send it to the schools and i didn't like that idea because that would be an imposition on the teachers uh, and teachers are already overburdened and how the hell are they going to teach something just because a curriculum is given to them without their own understanding about the thing. So I felt that the teachers should be treated as agents of change themselves. And if I created a professional development program for teachers, we could do two things with the same program. We could provide the opportunity for teacher leaders to immerse themselves in the study of nonviolence. And then they can create the curriculum for their own students the way they see it fit, which would be consistent with the idea of nonviolence. So that's how this teacher leadership program was designed, where we would have a call for applications. The program is open to teachers all over the United States. And then when the applications come, we selected anywhere from you know, uh, 30 to 35 teachers who showed the aptitude for learning. You know, And there was, there was no, there was, it's called a fellowship, which meant that fellows will not have to worry about any of their expenses while they were with us for 15 days. We would take care of them, but they won't get a penny in their hand. And they would have to get their, they would have to find a way to travel on their own expense. The idea was that we didn't want to create money 
as an attraction, but work as an attraction. That do you want to immerse yourself? And we work them very hard. Uh, it's a very intensive program. And we got such wonderful uh, fellows in the program who were not only motivated, um, but now once they left the program, they were deeply inspired uh, to do something with what they had learned and wanted to do more. Um, and so one of the requirements of the program was that they, after they learned, you know, the basics of nonviolence and nonviolent social change, and they immersed themselves in the study of people like Gandhi King, Cesar Chavez, you know, and others, Mandela, for example, uh, that they would then create at least two lessons, at least two lessons that they can integrate within the subject that they teach. So we left it to them whether they're going to create a lesson that they teach as English teachers or they teach as social studies teacher, um, you know, or as science teachers, however they want to create it, but they would have to integrate that in their lessons. And then the idea was that they might be able to create that, but what if their administrators did not allow them to teach in the schools? So as part of the application pro process, we required them that in addition to their own proposal to participate in the program, they would have to get, you know, a letter of support from their administrator. And that support, that person will have to write in writing that they will support these activities and to the implementation of the program goals within their schools and school districts. We also required them to do at least one workshop within their school district, sharing what they had learned in this program and inspiring their colleagues to do the same. So that created, you know, the feedback that we get from them from time to time is that they have not only em are empowering their students with this powerful content that they have integrated into their uh, uh, curriculum, but they've also created, you know, pedagogical shifts uh, in teaching in the classroom, in classroom management, so that there are less problems occurring within their classroom. The students are less resentful uh, in what is going on within the classroom. There is less conflict occurring with the administration among them. So those are some of the positive things that they see in their own classrooms and in their own professional lives. And I might add something that you will be interested uh, sometime later, that uh, there are nearly 18 or 19 um, teachers who have uh, contributed essays to a volume that two of the former fellows have co-edited, and it is in proofs right now, uh, America's Teachers Teaching Nonviolence. Wow. So I am looking forward to that. How many looking. teachers have passed through these programs? Approximately? So I would say roughly about a couple of hundred, a little more than a couple of hundred. Okay. Um, but we were not able to do um, the program for the last couple of years. Well, I should not say that because uh, in 2019, I did a different program. I did a seminar because there was this, from where this volume is coming. So there was this interest among the fellows. Usually we take the new teachers every summer. But this time there was an interest from the fellows. Some of them were telling, can we come back? Can we do something? We want to deepen our experience with nonviolence. Hundreds of lesson plans that have emerged over the years through these teachers. And there is a project that some, some other teachers are undertaking to put them all together uh, in a print form, if possible. So we are exploring that. So all of that, that thing is happening. But now with COVID, you know, most of my HINSA programs are on hold for now. And I have to kind of rethink what, 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 are, what can we do? Perhaps a Zoom lecture series or something like that. Out of this vast experience that you have accumulated, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the doable things that you could offer as, uh, you know, possibilities that these young people could uh, work with? 
in their own yeah. life and wherever they are whatever walk of life they are yeah so if they if they want to believe you know i'm i'm starting from that that premise that they want to believe in non violence yes then they have to take a step further and experiment with non violence so instead of getting daunted by violence uh, i would ask them to experiment with it because if you don't give a chance to non violence you cannot ascertain its efficacy in order to ascertain its efficacy whether it is going to work or not work you know let's take a scientific approach let's take an approach let's give it a try so depending on you know what kind of situation or what kind of non violence one is looking at whether one is looking at non violence in the context of personal life or non violence in the context of interpersonal life or non violence in the context of social change you will have to try something you will have to take a step if you are genuinely interested in non violence not as a lip service but as a genuine interest then you will have to take the next step just as you would in any other instance if you wanted to ascertain its efficacy so that's what i would encourage that take the next step try out for yourself experiment without experimenting you really cannot say it doesn't work or it works so try out for yourself you can read history and you can his read history of non violent change and you can see feel convinced that it has worked for some but if you want to see for yourself whether it works you got to ex you know experiment you got to dare to do things that you have not done so far would you uh, would you say as something here about uh, not giving up too easily yeah yeah i think there is a tendency like cesar chavez says that violence is an easy thing it's a trap because it it appears as an easy solution somebody hits you it's a reflex action you hit them back because that that comes easy you think that will solve the problem but what happens in the end in the end that actually increases the violence violence we gets violence so if we have seen that violence has not led us to any kind of solution wars have only led to more wars then it is time to try out something different and without trying we cannot you know uh, say that non violence doesn't work or that it only works for gandhi or it only works for king it cannot work for us no it can work but you know maybe it can work for us in baby steps it doesn't have to be you know a huge vision of changing the world or changing a society but you can start it from yourself or your own surroundings Thank you so much Tara Namaskar